Good morning, CarolinaCon. Good morning, CarolinaCon. We're ready to start the next talk. If everybody would like to have a little settling. Good morning. Today we have John. He's a frequent conference attendee and has been a past presenter. He has an interest in all things computing and has spent the past year studying machine learning. Consequently, he's this year sharing what he has learned with you and how you could do something cool with this stuff. Give it up for John and thanks for coming. Hey, uh, thanks for letting me be here. Uh, wow, that was a really nice talk. The, the black hat, the black badge people, that is incredibly significant. And I feel like I'm. Uh, the Bay City Rollers uh, opening up for the Beatles here. <coughs> um, and now my phone is dropped and we have to have Wi-Fi, so give me a second. We got through the display, now we're tethering in portable. Please don't hack my phone while I'm trying to do this. All right, so we got like uh, we got more slides than we got minutes, and some slides have videos. <clears throat> so this is like uh, machine learning. Like it's going to be broken up into four parts. The first part is kind of like a buzz. Like you know, you hear machine learning all the time. You're like, what is it? Man, that's how I started on it. And then I took a class and I failed miserably, and I was like, I need some motivation. And we'll have the various parts, but this is the first. So then you know, buzz, you know, you see web ads, you see in the news, analytics, big data. There's a whole lot of data, a whole lot of data. You can't do everything uh, manually to look at it. So they put up generalized methods to solve problems. Uh, <clears throat> just some funnies. You know, one day I saw this guy here and I was like, uh, I'm not going to show the All whole right, video. Let's take a step back, report. reconfigure, and consult the data. Of course, great idea. We have exclusive access to big data. Isn't that right, Mike? Um, well, the truth is we have data, but not big data. God damn it, Mike. I told the clients we had big data. Well, when I said I had access to big data, I mean I know of big data. I'm just, um, I don't know him personally. Him? So, yeah, so when you see this, you're like, first I want to show some buzzwords at you, and you're like, I know you're struggling. Python, pig, you know, you see these things and you're like, that ain't real. Well, it is. So they're actually, they've got, it's based in some reality. I'm going to show the whole thing. You can look at it. The presentation's there. One day, uh, I saw this guy, and I swear to God, on LinkedIn, this guy comes up all the time. Do you know this guy? You know, and he will never connect with me. But he had this post about going to a job interview, and I encourage you to read it. When I was reading it, it was like, because they always ask me, like, solve some problem and yada 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 but uh, this guy he's like playing at the fizz buzz interview he's throwing machine learning at it and it's just like the the hilariousness of this interviewer uh you know do you need help getting started and the guy's doing a neural network uh, uh solution to it perceptrons we're going to talk about that in a little bit later it's actually something that came out in the 40s when i first heard it i heard it i was like that ain't real, you know? They didn't know computers in the 40s, like analog type computers, but, but they did. So, so it, it's coming back. <clears throat> then one day, and I take a lot of classes on Coursera to, to keep my skills up to date, and things like 10 things like this, but I see this thing from Stanford University, and I took one a class from Stanford prior to this that I really liked, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be the one. And it has this like happy little robot, you know, I'm like, oh, this is, dude, this is me. I'm going to have fun. And I, you know, I look at the syllabus and I'm like, oh, yeah, linear regression, one variable. I think I know what that means. It's not that big a deal. It's one variable. Uh, <clears throat> Octave, MATLAB, I've used that. You know, it's been a while. Neural networks, yeah, that's, that sounds really cool. And anomaly detection, one of my first jobs uh, as a summer intern in college was, was 
it was a power plant, and they were like looking at all the different motor control centers, and the guy was like taking numbers, putting in a database, so that he could do preventative maintenance. So, like when this one motor control center is using too much current, maybe a fuse is getting ready to go bad or something. And then I had just also around this time, I had done like talked to some guys about doing OCR for a job, and I. I remember like how they were talking about doing it and I was like, oh yeah, well I could learn how to do it here and I could apply it to that, yada, yada, yada. It's, I'm taking this class. You know, in week one, you know, I'm like, oh wow, this is not that bad. It's, it's not even calculus really. It's the first thing, this is just summations. And then partial derivatives, okay, partial derivatives, that's just like holding each variable and varying it. No big deal. And you know, you're seeing like, uh, you know, a value subtracted from another value for all values, this is probably like he's calculating a mean. So I was like, oh, yeah, I got this, I can do this. And you get like to week nine, and you finally get to that anomaly detection thing. You're like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. And then you're going like, holy shit, like what? this is getting insane. Like I see mu, that's a mean standard deviation, and then there's that, there's another average of values to get means, and okay, I see yeah, what it, there's like a lot of stuff I'm not really sure, like, oh, we're going to do it. Now we're going to multiply everything instead of sum it. And I didn't do so hot. And so that cute little robot <clears throat> was more like Bender, or if you're really no berserk, Evil Otto, this guy, you know, right here. So, so what do you... <clears throat> Give me a little bit of time to read that. They told me uh, when I reviewed this, give them time to laugh so I don't confuse them. But, but anyway, like, like Rick and Morty, like what are you going to do if you don't know how to do something? You're just going to hop in there and keep on going, right? So that's me. I'm going to do this. So, it's, you know, intellectual curiosity is enough. How about money? So one time I was like uh, reading, uh, actually it was an audible book, and it was kind of like just like, you know, how are you going to learn machine learning from an audible book, right? But it was something interesting. It put me to sleep well at night when I went to bed. But I remember one night I was like, hold, did he say NC State? He was talking about something here. Like I did, like the, you were talking about B-sides in Raleigh. I, I, I know about B-sides in Las Vegas. I don't even know they had it here. But anyway, I saw this NC State uh, Institute for Advanced Analytics and guys are graduating. They're making the same money I am after three years. I'm like, what the fuck? How is this happening? You know, like, I, I got to get into this. Like, you know, like in skills sports, you see, uh, they, you know, all, they had a tool and it was like mapping skills and, you know, and I'm getting emails from people all the time and I'm like, you know, I need to start picking up my, my skill set. And then, you know, I, I do stuff where I try to, to go on these different freelance sites. I know people give grief about Upwork, but if you're just starting out and you want to do something, you can do all kinds of things on Upwork. Um, Maybe you don't make a, you know, it's not like the level 10 making, you know, money, but level one, you're starting out and you're building that base. <clears throat> so here's an Upwork example of an RFP for machine learning that I, that I, I looked at. I actually talked to the guy. I didn't get it. But uh, he was talking about data acquisition, you know, 80 gigs. Yes, a lot of data. Slurm. I know all about Slurm. I saw that on The Simpsons. Uh, PCA, I'm not really sure. And litterers. This was for a job in the Middle East. I wanted to go back to the Middle East, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I didn't get it, but I was like, I got to keep at this. Maybe I can do this in the future. So, so now we're into like part two, like, you know, how are you, how am I going to learn it, right? <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of guides, there's classes, there's a, you know, there's also this tie-in between all, uh, machine learning, internet things, big data, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and you know, so those options like website, book, iTunes, audio classes, etc. Where do I start? And my pal just finished the, an online master's for sixty thousand from Berkeley. Had to, you know, it had a really it was a legitimate like he had to have good GRE scores to get admitted. But you know, so I'm like, which which is the best way? So you know. Quora, it's kind of a joke. Like, I, there was a Quora post that came this week, and it said, like, how boring is an entry data level science job or something? It was kind of fun. But I'm not going to click all the links, but I will show you some excerpts. The guy says, 
oh, Andrew Ning, you need to take that class, right? Uh, and when he did, when this guy took it, he was like, I realized I had lacking in skills, linear algebra, calculus, probability theory. And then he said he took the Harvard stats class, and I took some of the Harvard classes, and, and they were tough, but they were good. And then the neural networks and deep learning, that's the, the Hinton guy in Toronto. Um, that's a 15-week class, we'll talk about that. Uh, some other guy says, you know, he goes on for like 16 paragraphs about his career, including Kaggle competitions. Kaggle competitions are where they, it's like their CTF we were talking about earlier, this is like, here's a machine learning uh, problem, and we know the answer, but we want to see how well you do. Guy's talking to me, you know, he's doing that. I, I've never done that. It's impressive if you ask me. And he says, now I understand over four years I know nothing. I was like, after all the stuff I know, I, I know nothing too. So I was like, Anyway, I thought the last bit about the robots aren't going to take my jobs and wow accounts. <clears throat> Some other guys talking about, oh yeah, you know, I took Coursera, I took Udemy, um, DataCamp, you can do all these things. Uh, I have never taken the Udacity stuff, but Udacity has two. They have a, an ML class and a data science class. Yada, yada, yada. Let's go to the next one. And then you see some, you'll see things like this every time. This is from Reddit, a super horse guide to machine learning. And I, and I just like that's, that's the, the blunt style. Read that book. And that book is a great book. It's more R. Um, it's an expensive book, but it's like color graphs. It's, it's worth it. And it's not, and it's like a, when it says introduction, it's a low level gentle as it comes, right? And he's like, take the Andrew Ning you know, class, Kaggle competitions, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Andrew's the one from Stanford. <clears throat> and then there was this other guy that came out, and I thought that was uh, interesting when I was preparing this talk and I was looking at it. The guy said he dropped out of a university level program just to do, because he was getting the same kind of stuff through EDX, Coursera, and Udacity. In fact, Udacity sent me a thing because um, I had signed up and talked to him, you know, never actually took anything where they had a deal where if you can pass uh, the, the entrance exam and then get into this ML class you're, and you complete it, you're going to get a job with uh, Uber to do their self-driving car. And, and so I was actually thinking like, I could do that. Um, I read this book. Um, this book you can also get in audible form. Uh, I shouldn't say I read the book, I said I listened to it in audible form, um, talk about naked statistics, it just because all this is stats based, it's pretty good and he has a good example of a central limit theory and one time I was taking a class from University of Amsterdam and it, it was a similar thing and then as I was like, I was like, man that sounds like they plagiarized those other guys. <laughs> and then later after it, the guy literally says this came from this Charles Wheaton book. They were talking about identifying uh, Americans at a, who were on a, athletes on a bus versus tourists, yada, yada, yada. All right, so before we talk about my experience with these classes, let's talk about ML and its various fields because I want to show you how the classes kind of fit into this. So right now in your technology skill set, what people are looking for are these kind of things. And these are not representative of the size of that field and just makes a nice picture. But you notice the Internet of Things, security, mobile, servers, cloud, yada, yada. Machine learning and data science are kind of twins. <clears throat> and in there, like if, there's a lot of things you know, in terms of development. You know, you've got the technical skills, you've got development processes, and I know a guy here and will be very strong on that, um, yada, et cetera. And then You've heard the thing about 10,000 hours to master a skill, so like if you could characterize a skill, you know, here's the, the domain of that knowledge. We'll visualize a, really what it is. It's a bunch of little bits of knowledge that you go and you learn and you put it together and this kind of bubbles up and it fades in and out as things go from memory and you forget about it, they fade out, or the technology fades out, it fades out, et cetera, et cetera. But, if you keep hitting these things on a regular basis, this thing will begin to take shape and you will get this nice circle here. All right, so with that, let's go to this 
my experience with MOOCs. I said I've taken a lot. I'm not showing any of this iOS or Android specialization type stuff, but, but basically I made a grid here. This one show at the very top, the ML class. It's going to say like, you know, if it's an institution, a, a website associated with it, um, mine are primarily Coursera and EDX. If it's part of a series or a specialization, how long they last, kind of what the, the skills that they, they teach, uh, how hard it is, the quality, and the prereqs. Um, this last column is just so I could select as I'm building this up. Um, some of these, like bioinformatics for beginners, is I, I took that class, I, don't know, I still don't know jack about DNA and how it combines, but you guys might appreciate this like I did. The very first thing it starts out with is the Golden Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. I think that's it. And that's the crypto, right? Well, the guy's using that as a model to say, like, let's get DNA and treat it as words, letters and words, and combine them, and how we can combine them to make sequences. Um, at the very end, they're going to do stuff with, like, uh, Monte Carlo, uh, which I thought was, like, really cool. And it's also... <coughs> weird Russian website that uh, <coughs> excuse me weird Russian website where I can never navigate to find a place <coughs> uh, you've got the R programming stuff uh, from Johns Hopkins I didn't finish the specialization oh uh, yeah thanks alright appreciate it some of the stats classes from Zurich, uh, the Harvard ones I was talking about, still don't know about life sciences. The linear algebra from Texas is, uh, the, the straight math is fine, thank you, appreciate it, but the, where they're like trying to use their tools rather than using MATLAB in general, I didn't find that interesting. Uh, some of these image processing things and those kind of classes, uh, they've got uh, image processing here at Duke, they got one out at Northwestern. They're really good because when I was in school 20 years ago, it was all audio. Um, linear, lots of, there's a linear algebra class down in Davidson, that's by Charlotte. Uh, embedded systems shape the world. These are like embedded classes. You actually, it's not machine learning, but sensors are a lot of times the inputs to ML. And you're actually going to build like a TI part and you're going to, when you grade your homework, he's literally going to have you run the debugger and do certain things where you're like plugging wires into a, a physical board and that it was just like really cool. But that's not so much ML but it's, it's the domain. Alright, so, so enough fluff, uh, you know, show me what you got, you may be familiar with this. This part we're going to kind of talk about the ML algorithms, the tie into big data, and that'll be kind of off of the slant. But it, but like if you take the the Ning class, it's going to be 90% ML, and then a little bit about like how to do it in the big scale. If you uh, do the same thing with the University of Washington, it's going to be same kind of thing, a little bit of slant to the side on on, on uh, big data. But if you do some of the Spark-based classes, you're in the big data arena already, and, it, and that's really kind of the emphasis. Uh, <coughs> algorithms, the big picture. Um, ripped this slide off, came off of like a LinkedIn post. Uh, it's talking about the difference between types of ML. There's supervised and unsupervised. A supervised learning is where you've got a bunch of data, and, and the example I'm going to give, I'm going to have audio waves we're going to get to and I'm going to say these are samples that are like a something that I'm looking for and these are just generic samples that I don't really care and I want to get a binary classifier to classify the two um, and in that I'm going to do this with a nearest neighbor but I think there is also there is also a decision tree and he's not showing that I just noticed on my slide he's got decision trees and regression but it's a classification, so I would have put it on the other side. All right, so the, here's the one slide guide to regression. Now we're, <coughs> we're, we're getting into a little bit of the meat. I hope you're seeing we're coming some easy, we're gonna go down. So the, the typical example that they always do is like uh, houses and prices. 
So, you know, a, a graph here on the left, you know, you're going to say like, okay, for a certain number of square feet, we had a house that was sold at a certain sales price. And, you know, if you remember physics, like least mean squares, that's where they taught us the first time, uh, you know, you're going to fit a curve through there that minimizes the error, right? So, well, before they do that, let's, in terms of coefficients, let's just look at a constant, right? There's no variable. And let's click this. And you know, just told you the average. I mean, it's not the actual calculated average. I just eyeballed it. And, you know, and that's a kind of a model that's very simple. So the complexity is, you know, in this axis is very small, but the error should be rather large, you know, like the error for that guy. And if you're, if you're doing the error of all the points, it's going to add up, right? All right, so let's hit it again. So let's, how about, let's do a linear curve, you know, and how we're going to find the, the best fit for this. Let's do a quadratic, you know, it's second order, and you know, they always have, like my nice curves there. They always, you know, come up, they reach a max, and they go back down. Well, this one may not be a good fit. Uh, and then you could do, like, some polynomials. Polynomials, you know, you have a lot of coefficients. You know, you have, a, you have the constant term, you have the, the linear term, you have the squared term, the cube term, et cetera. So however complex you want to make it. And, yeah, you can fit every single data point you have, right? But if you have this data point with this square foot, is it really going to be right there? I mean, you know, it, it could be up here, and this curve would, would mit, miss. So when you're doing your training, your train, you, you, as your complexity goes up, yeah, you have no error. But when you put in a test data point, something that was not included in the data set that you included, it's typical the test error will go up. So you kind of want to find the, the sweet spot right here. There's a validation type thing as well, but we're not uh, and then just getting some errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying. That should have shown that first. The errors first. The one slide guide. One slide guide to classification. Let's say you're going to try to classify shapes. So you're going to kind of fingerprint them for what they are. So you know a square, four sides, all the angles sum to 360. Yada yada yada. You put all these numbers in, and you start putting in shapes. You could find that pattern. I, I heard it say, the guy say uh, one time, he says, like, if you can kind of visualize a pattern and, you, and you, you can see the pattern, but you can't actually mathematically capture it, machine learning could solve it for you. But if you can see it and there's no pattern, machine learning ain't going to help you. All right. And so I added this in because I'm glad this morning, but I'm sorry for this is just a slide from a class. But really what I wanted to show you here is these model complexities. And he's doing a uh, classification where he's very complex, and he's got this really uh, complicated uh, thing. And, and you, you don't want to do that. Something that's kind of simple. This captures most of the points that are uh, identified as black, and that's what you're looking for with just kind of a squared curve. All right. Another way to identify things with this fingerprint is to go with a uh, K-means algorithm. Sorry, I'm putting a, throwing a slide in real quick. He's going to find the nearest neighbors. Uh, if you have K nearest neighbors as in K is 3, you're going to look for 3 nearest neighbors based on what they are is what you are. Right? You, know, you put a point in, if he's near the 3 guys that are identified as class red, well, chances are he's a red. You can also do into probabilities to, to kind of find, like, when you're on that distance, how far off you are, how probable you are when you make decisions. Uh, decision trees are really trivial. They're, I, I heard it said that, you know, originally they were the thing. Later they became out of favor, and then they taught a new dog new tricks on how to speed this up and to get better results. And we're going to do this later in this demo. And basically you're saying, like, oh, we're going to try to figure out if we've got credit scores that are good or bad. Uh, or, or a loan is good or bad, so we're going to look at their various scores. All right, so that's kind of the basics. Now we're going to kind of, this is a little bit of a warning as a topic shift, go over the big data. You've all heard of, of Google's MapReduce. There's a link to the paper and how it's working, but one of the things that's nice is it's good for matrices. And it allows you to send out a cluster of computers as a framework for doing stuff quickly. Um, did 
that's good. And then here's some, just some slides on how that works, how you're going to take, and it's all a hash map, and so how that hash map collects things. Uh, Spark is, rides on top of that MapReduce framework, which is implemented as Hadoop, and it's like it has SQL-like uh, syntax for one component, and then it has like the PySpark, it has graph databases, yada, yada, yada. Uh, once again, that big data thing where he was like saying pig and graphx and stuff, this is kind of how this all fits together. Not so much machine learning, but when you're doing it in the large, and you want to have a framework for clustering, there it is. Uh, thank you for trying to pair with me. Okay, so anyway, so ML modeling. Uh, ML modeling, uh, we're going to have some training data, we're going to have feature extraction, and, and feature extraction is things that identify it, right? You know, these are, the, in those features earlier, we were just looking at square foot, but what happens if you put in like bathrooms, lot size, distance to the hospital, et cetera? And you're going to determine which one of those in that model are the actual best ones, and it's kind of a feedback loop, and then you're going to throw in the test see like with testing you actually get these other things and there's a quality metric going on <coughs> and so and also kind of going back a little bit the obligatory neural net slide um, I just want to say this was kind of kind of cool to me because when I was in college I picked up this book from MIT press where this brain surgeon wrote this thing on vehicles and he's talking about analog type of things like if I have a, a wheel and the wheel has got a connection to a light detector and the wheel speeds up when it detects light uh, and you have two of them and you have them uh, crosswise so that the, the wheel on the right will speed up when the wheel on the left gets a, more light then it will turn that way the other ones will make it turn the other way so it would have a vehicle that would literally go to the light and it's a pretty cool book uh, here is a linear class, I'm kind of going backwards, linear classifiers making gates. Uh, so it's like an analog value, so you know you have this constant coming in of a minus one half. If these two guys, if either one of these guys fire, one plus uh, minus one half is still a positive number. Anything that's a positive number would fire this output. And this is, I kind of like these old school papers where they're actually typewritten and you can find the PDFs. This is the Gregory Hinton paper uh, for this, which is the guy from Toronto, which is based upon this old 19, I can't remember the date here, uh, or maybe I'm going the opposite way. It's like in the 40s. Okay, so now part four, I'm serious. Show me what you got. What do you know? All right, so I, you know, when I was trying to make this talk, I was like, I wanted to make it in kind of a few parts. I wanted to show you kind of like the ML thing, how to kind of learn ML, and then I wanted to give you a, a real demonstration so that you can kind of understand it. I, so, you know, there's gonna be the goal. We're gonna talk about the MVP progression. MVP is minimum viable product. Uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit of audio analysis because this is an audio problem. And we're gonna do like a demo with that in a couple of different uh, frameworks. So, that, so but keep this in mind, it's unfinished. And I, that was just a joke there. All right, so the Google Slides don't remember the time frame, so I'm gonna move this over to this game. Get over so, here and heal. Before I start this off, you know, this is a game. There's six people playing six people. The everybody's a you know human. There's like you're not playing against the environment. So those they're they're making decisions you know, to fight against you. You're familiar with that. But in this game, every uh, person that you play has a special ability or ultimate, and they have an announcement that gives you a warning that they fired it off. This one particular guy that I I want to do. I want to make a, a system to detect when this guy fires his ultimate. Because I may have headset on, I may be talking to people, bombs could be going off, I could miss it, 
but I want to have something in the room like flash a light, uh, sound a siren that I can't miss, and if it goes for 20, 30 seconds after its ultimate ability is on, I want to fire a, a, you know, another thing to say all clear, and I can come back out and, and run around normally. And um, his ultimate ability is I've got you in my sights. He's going to do two invocations of it. The first one is not quite obvious. Hello. Gunshots are going off, but you saw him light it. Also, listen to the bomb. I've got you in my sight. You hear that that constant tone? That should be easy to detect right there, right? <clears throat> so. So the typical approach that you find with like an Amazon Echo or a Google Home device or, you know, when you hit the, you know, transcribe audio button and you're talking, what they're doing is they're, they've got a waveform, like I've got you in my sights, and they send that raw data, which is this waveform, up to the cloud. The cloud does heavy lifting on it, and then it sends back a yes, no, or if you're doing voice recognition, it sends it down the character string, right? And they've got all the samples of all the things that people have said, and they possibly have your particular sample, so they know kind of what you do, right? I, so typical way I would do this, or should be done, is in this kind of mechanism, right? And you come back, and your little electronic device fires a siren, fires the all clear sometime later. Being kind of crazy, I was like, well, I'm going to do this with a little you know, small embedded board that has DSP capabilities. But what I want to do is I know I can't take all of this data in this little megahertz chip instead of this big, you know, gigahertz computer. I'm going to identify what features of that audio are important, and I only want to test on that feature. I think that can be done. We'll see. Like I said, it's unfinished be the goal for my fourth presentation here. So like, you know, so like, how do I do this? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Google, right? That's what everybody does. And I go to Stack Overflow. And if you ever, <clears throat> and I, I'm looking and I'm like, okay, DSP, yeah, yeah, I know all about that, a little bit. MFCs, you're going to see that all the time. I, to this day, I really don't know what MFCs are, I, but, and I'm going to do some classification with them. Turns out I didn't look at them, but he's also about LPCs, some simple FFT features. FFTs are where you're going to go from time domain to frequency domain, and then you can do a lot of things in the frequency domain. And then I go down here, and I'm like, I'm trying to see, I remember I was reading, and some guy, let's see, where was it? It's one of these guys, I know, what was the answer? Oh, yeah, this was the guy. He's not a big answer. Over there. It's like, this is an extremely hard problem. I remember the Mick, Rick and Morty? Well, that didn't stop me. We'll, just, we'll see what we can do. You haven't failed if you haven't. You never fail unless you fail to try, right? Sometime later, I find this paper. <clears throat> and it's for a guy, some guys from Microsoft. I was like, I'm not a big fan of Microsoft. If those Microsoft guys can do it with well, their big budget and the incompetence they have, I can do it. Being negative, the more power to the Microsoft guys. But anyway, so you just look at the paper, and this is about as much as I had to look at it. Feature analysis. He's going to go down. He's like high zero crossing rate ratio. Well, you know, what is that? Well, you know, it's not not very difficult to see that he's just counting how many times the frequency counts crosses a zero cross. Then the, uh, there's this short term energy ratio. <laughs> ZCR, which is a time-based thing, and I'm like, oh yeah, well if I had to do that, like counting samples and once again going across the sign and summing them up, oh yeah, that DSP will grind through that. That'll be no problem. And LSP distance measure, spectral spectrum flux, and now he's in 
frequency domain. I'm like, well, I, I knew I was going to have to do a DSP operation. I, but when I was looking over here, I was like, well, that's like complex math. Uh, you may not understand it, but you know, given time and energy, maybe we can. Chroma factor, band curiosity, yada, yada, yada. But the key thing is down here, they're saying that they're going to come in with, with this uh, audio sequence, and they're going to send them to all these different things. And based upon which ones you know, are fired, they're going to make some kind of decision, and they're going to be able to say, oh, it's speech, music, environment, or silence. They were trying to look for four classes. I'm only doing two. I, you know, so I, I, this is kind of what I'm doing. So they gave me some ideas. And I went off and I started doing some stuff. You know, and, and, and so this is the MVP progression that I talked about that I had in my mind. I'm like, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get some recorded samples. I'm gonna work with it in MATLAB. I'm gonna look, look at some graphs based upon those graphs. I'm, you know, and, and the results. I'm gonna have this key feature identification. And that part is done at this point in time. And then the thing I want to do is I want to take those recorded samples with those ML identified features, implement it in C++ on, on this laptop. You know, this is going to be much more powerful than the, the device that I'm going to build. If I can do that, let's do it with live samples. That's like trivial, right? Now we're going to get live audio in four seconds and do it. Let's do it with iOS. Now one of the reasons why I like iOS is I can write code for it as well, but it's also their Apple prod, Apple CPU is based upon an ARM 8, and it has a SIMD thing in it. So you know it's kind of like a similar device. If I can do it there, then maybe I can go down to the next level, which is the F4 STM32 F4. It's kind of like a it's a Cortex M4. Uh, it's a Harvard architecture, meaning that you can it's good for doing max multiply accumulates. Uh, that's like how much memory it has. Though. All right, so just how I started out, I was, I'm not going to do all of this, but I just got my iPad out and sat it beside me and started making tracks of playing the game. And that's a clean audio I've got you in your sights, I saved. That's sample one. Uh, another one, and I was kind of, I'm, did you hear I got you in the sight? And you hear that tone after it? Uh, and I'm just kind of trying to line them up so that I'm going to be, when I start sampling, they're all going to be on the, the same time frame. So <clears throat> as I was doing this, I, I found this guy's book. It's like, you know, you find a Stack Overflow post, you find a reference, and it's like, how do you do this in MATLAB? And this kept coming up, so I bought this book. This book, he doesn't say anything about machine learning, introduction to an audio analysis with MATLAB, but it's a machine learning book. He builds multiple classifiers in it. This other one is more like the old style stuff of uh, linear systems, but it's still pretty good. It, some of the things that he's trying to explain, like maybe ZCR, you could see it better in the other guys. Um, I, the guy was very approachable. I sent him some emails. He replied back to me twice. Uh, it was like he, uh, so buy his book. I recommend it. He actually told me he's got some stuff in Python, and I saw that, uh, but I didn't use it. All right, now you're not going to be able to read this. I'm not even going to try it, but I, this morning I redrew these things. But basically, this is kind of what I did. You know, I was like looking at a waveform. And based upon his code, how was his code going to do this? And it's a slight tweaking, but he's basically going to, you're going to window your time base signal for 40 milliseconds of uh, time, and you're going to, with no overlap, sample them. Uh, then you're going to combine these up into all of these different features, and I will show you this based upon frames. And then you're going to get midterm features where there's a, you got that still that four second of audio, I've got you in my sights, that's how long it takes. And now you're going to have some overlapping of short term features into midterm features. And then you're going to get your final aggregation of uh, a number, right? 
for each sample for so let me go here so a little bit readable overview I made this morning you've got 14 this is the like, for the 14 samples that I made for the soldier each sample here is going to have uh, this number of samples times two it's times two because it's stereo right I really only need one I and I'm not really even going to like take the average of the two. I'm literally just going to take one channel. There's 100 frames. They're non-overlapping. They're only for 40 milliseconds. So that means now you've got 100 uh, samples, 100 frames of this many samples. Then you're going to take, uh, for each one of those frames, you're going to get a single number for each frame for each characteristic. Remember I showed you the one at the very beginning, there's ZCR, spectral flux, spectral roll off, yada, 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 those 35 numbers. Then you're gonna create that big array, which is of those four overlapping two second frames, all of these uh, 35 times 50, and you're gonna take the mean, you're gonna take the standard by mean, the max, yada, 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 there's six aggregations. And then you're going to collapse that into 210 by 1. And that is kind of like a fingerprint of this particular waveform. Now that you have that waveform, you've got a lot of columns uh, for that, that uh, fingerprint. All right, so just the last one here is you're going to have the, uh, the soldier samples, the gameplay samples. You're going to add one extra feature here which is the label which you're going because this is supervised learning I'm going to say this sample is soldier this sample is game all right and here's a video we will watch this one because this one's kind of cool I just modified his code so I could show the effect of that windowing function and so up here at the top this is your um, the waveform as it's being read and then if you took a rectangular window of that frame, it would look like this. But you don't want to take a pure rectangle because that makes at your ends a discontinuity and that throws in artifacts. So they will window it with like a Gaussian function or a Hamming function, Hamming window. And you can see a little bit like here, it's, they're going to be zero at the end. And then with that, just eyeballing it, looking at for that, here's the waveform for this particular sample. This is number one, this is the clean one. How, graphing those features, right? And you can see, like I think this is the max. These that are in this stack here, they all kind of have a max that goes flat, goes down, and then it goes straight across. Um, this one has kind of a little bit of a curve. It doesn't have, it's got four segments instead of three. There's quite a few of those. And then there's like one or two outliers that were completely different, like they got louder. And, I, and uh, there it was, and this is ZCR, I think, is actually what I was looking at for that feature. Um, it got louder because something else happened, like a, a bomb just happened to go off. <clears throat> All right, so so just grind, let's just grind through his code uh, set for our stuff just to see what kind of results we get with this this data. And he's this Kfold. He's he's using this, so I'm trying to show you what it is. He's saying for iteration one, I'm going to say I don't have an, enough test and training data to have a clean separation. I'm going to kind of reuse them. And so when you do that, you have like a segment you've identified. Say. Say out of all of them, five of them are going to be reserved for tests. He's going to pick the first five, and the next time he's going to pick the next five, and the time after he's going to pick five after that. But what were the results from doing this? And he's using a nearest neighbor, which you remember is saying, like, find a node. What were the other ones uh, identified as? Is he, if he's in closer to those guys, then chances are that's what he is. Uh, and I loaded the... Did all of my samples. I did a little bit of uh, 
script class performance. That's what this is with the, the K values, showing that, you know, the simplistic one was like around four or five nearest neighbors, and then passing it in, and if you can read this, this is a soldier, and it was identified properly. Now, it should be identified properly because it was part of the test set, right? But just to kind of see if everything's working. But that doesn't really help me because a K nearest neighbor means I got to go out with this little DSP and I got to go and do all of that stuff. And I, I can't do that. I really have, I'm trying to find the key features. So I'm going to do a decision tree. And here, I said 450 and 6. Like I said, the links, if I embed them, they won't go to that one. But I want to show you those two. So 459 points. And you can look at these in your offline. 450. So around this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the mean ZCR, uh, mean energy, a couple of things, and, it, and it's a scatter plot. I'm going to pause it here for a second. So I'm going to try to pause it. I think I'm going to. And so. You know, you've got you got so, you got 35 dimensions, right? So you can't see. I can't visualize that, but I can, three at a time I can. And so I'm just going to pick some, and I'm going to kind of rotate this around. And and red versus blue are the samples. Like, you know, this plot is for um, a soldier sample, and this is for a gameplay. And I want to see if I can draw a plane through those to kind of separate them. If I can. I can, you know, it, it can be determined which is which. And so I'm gonna kind of rotate it around. So and kind of one of the things about this is this is MATLAB. And different, all this code that I've got up there will work in MATLAB and Octave. But with MATLAB, when you, it costs money, but they give you these apps and you can like just drag stuff to it. And this is kind of one of those apps for, for graphing. But when you, when you're That's looking okay. through there, and, and I'm going to turn it on its side to just look at two. Let's put let's see, it's around see. 607. I'm just going to let it play. Energy. Kind of see it here, and like you know, there's a lot of blues on one side on this mean so ZCR. Let's kind of look at this again. And we've turned it on its side, so I'm going to pause it here. And so possibly what I could do is I could draw a graph right through this. 0.3, and I would have a separation. Now, yeah, there's some blues over there, and yada, 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 but it doesn't have to be, it's, and it's, chances are it's not going to be 100% accurate, but that's really also not, you know, that important to me, because if that siren goes off, and I know that I didn't hear it, it's okay. I'd rather be conservative, and, and maybe I initially hide, but oh, no, it's not real. I have other things I can detect. So here is another one. So this is a um, that same app, MATLAB. But now I'm just going to say, like, okay, given I've, I've you know I've saved off my data, I have everything in one big table. Let's just throw that table into uh, their their machine learning app, and let's just play with it how it works. All right, so and I forgot so they, to look so at I got the, it is 310. And the next one was 17. So let's All right, so I, and what the what's leading up here is some of this in the beginning is some these different models. But right here, I've, I've just clicked to say start a new session with my workspace variables. And basically, for this combined samples um, thing that I've created, you can see all of the different features. And I know it's not readable, but there at the very bottom will be that label. And it's kind of cool how MATLAB will find that that is the one categorical variable that it would detect as the response variable. And so it's already figured this out. I should scroll down here in a second. 
and there it is, right? That's what you're looking for. That's your target. And let's see, go to seven. And it's building a confusion matrix. We're seeing for this one, he's only identified, I think that's a seven out of 14 were soldiers. And that was not that good a selection for the, I'm showing here like how to uh, configure this for different uh, characteristics. But here's one that's interesting. I think that's 13 and three. So 13 of those soldier samples were identified, right? promising based on a decision tree. Uh, this is a uh, another app and I, I think this is worth showing to people who are just starting out because this uh, Kamaim, it's a Constance, which is a university in uh, Germany, uh, data mine, data miner or something or something like that. Uh, but it's kind of a drag and drop thing. It's based upon this thing called Weka. Basically, you have a node that reads a CSV. You configure it to say like what the file name is. I, I had noticed that there was a column of data and it was in, actually, I think, in the, either in the MFCs or the chroma vector had a bunch of not a numbers, so, so there was some sort of error. And so I just want to take that one out because that's not going to be part of my consideration. Uh, a color range is just saying, you know, if, uh, if a value is a soldier label, I want to say a soldier is blue to match whatever MATLAB was doing. Uh, it has a, uh, a thing where it splits off your, of your samples, which part is training and which part is test. And you have a learning tree uh, model and then the results. And what number did I say? Nine. It's funny, when I did this, I didn't realize I had hit the wrong button and I was looking at a max instead of a min, but let's compare something here. Let's pause this. So this pane here is the decision tree saying, hey, I've, I've, I only had to do one split. The one split that I came up with is max spectral roll off, which is one of the frequency characteristics. And if I look at that, yeah, sure enough, look right here. If I were to draw a line through there, primarily the random gameplay samples are to the left. And, and this is the MATLAB app. I'm just using that app to kind of look at things. And over here is the soldier samples. However, it turns out I think that this was max and I picked mean. So it's not, I, but if your max is greater, there's a good chance maybe your mean is also corresponding. Uh, Splunk, the only reason I, I'm going to show two examples, I'm going to show where it worked and where it didn't work. I had done some work with Splunk, um, which is like this tool for big data, but it has a machine learning capability in it. And I kind of was like really wanting to be a big fan of Splunk because when I went out to DEF CON, the guys that do the Wall of Sheep, I think they're sponsored by Splunk. And so I was like, oh, this could be cool, but it's, it's an expensive tool. And when I got like the community version that I could use forever for free, uh, it turns out like the ML stuff won't work with it. So I have to like try to go back and get the paid version to get that tool in. And, and it's like, yeah, anyway, the bottom line, and it had problems, so it didn't really work. But I will show you that with all this like fanciness for doing stuff for you, it gave me a result where, um, I'm just gonna get to the end here, right here, where he's saying like, hey, my accuracy is like 1.0. This guy is, he'll find every sample for you. But the problem next is, well, what, how, how did you do it? What was your decision tree that you came up with? I don't know how to query that. And with all like the little buttons you press, I didn't see it and what little query that I know from it I couldn't figure it out, but if you want to, it's you know it's something to look at. And I can't believe we've come to the end. Um, but here is a, and I, I want to show this. This is the 
example from, uh, it was like a homework slide. I'm just going to show you. Basically what I did was I took a homework assignment from uh, one of these classes. Uh, it's the University of Washington where they're, they're using a thing called graph frame. Uh, gra and they were, uh, graph lab, they, they were bought out by, the guy who started it got bought out by Apple and they're part of that big Apple thing so it, it must be uh, pretty good but I think maybe the reason they bought him was he did a really good job of explaining it. He has a good tool that works very fast and it's in these IPython notebooks which are similar to, to from my perspective, Mat Mathematica notebooks, you know, where you, you have cells, you put in stuff, and you hit shift enter, and you get a result. And there's a lot of tools like this, but it also has that big data frame. The data frame, pardon me, Graph Lab, I think it's a graph you wrote, but uh, data frames, are, the first time I saw them, are similar to what you see in R, which is basically a bunch of, uh, it, it's, a t it's a matrix, but it's a matrix that can hold multiple values. So you could have a column that has floating point numbers, you have a column that has uh, integers, you can have a column that has uh, text data. So let's go ahead and hit it here. And the wrong buttons. Uh, you have markdown cells and the markdown cells uh, just have text. Uh, you do an import, and all I'm going to do is let's run down to where we see the ZCR. Uh, one thing here, whenever you, this is an active cell, and this is kind of like the results. Whenever you see an asterisk, that's where it's like trying to figure out, you know, it's doing work, and then it's going to show you the results. And I did this this morning, I just want to Show you what's going on. Is it actually advancing? There you go. Uh, basically, here you're going to say like that label. You're going to make it into a plus minus one, plus or one or minus one instead of text. Uh, then uh, this part, he was trying to say, if you're really going to do this, you need to have your classes of your data balanced. And he was saying like get the ratio of sample of class X uh, samples to class Y and then undersample the one that has the most to give them uh, kind of an equal split but what happened with to get more accurate results but what happens here is the algorithm that was in place is for a lot of data like there's sections later where he's saying under the decision tree it's okay if, if I have a node with 50,000 samples in it uh, I don't, I, I've got like, what, 55 samples, so that ain't really going to work. And then when I downsample it, I ended up with like 22 samples, and so it, it didn't work very well at all. So, but with the ones that are there, it's okay. And I, I was just kind of, I made a point here, say like, as you take this class, you're going to be building up routines where they would say like, here's a function signature, you put your code in here, and that's what you had to figure out, and it kind of carries forward. But, and this was all like on loans, like uh, we're talking, you know, is it a good loan or a risky loan? But let's see what he gets for the splitting function. Uh, those are just routines, so they're not, it's just setting up the routines, not actually doing anything. But here it's creating the tree. Uh, so here he's saying, like, I split on mean ZCR, which is, which is good because it kind of validates what we did it when we did it a different way, right? Uh, but what's the value that he split on? And I believe I will show that. That's just showing you kind of like how you could print out the graph. I think I left it right here at the end. So yeah, he's not, he's saying on that mean ZCR, it's the feature, not the value. So here he's running, I'm going to use, I'll just hit pause, 
So right there, split on mean ZCR equals 0 0.35, which is good because that was that graph. I mean, you know, just kind of playing around, we saw that. And that's an hour. And I, I, I put everybody out of the room. <laughs> so that's that. I mean, uh, you got any questions? Was that as bad as I thought it was? <laughs> All right, very good. Thanks a bunch.